Well, good evening, Forever Family. My name is Marcia. I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm in recovery for alcohol, abuse, and low self-esteem. I was raised in Salt Lake City in a slightly upper middle class home. Um, I was the youngest of three children. I have an, an older brother and an older sister. My father owned his own business and was a great provider for our family. He spent a lot of time at work, and I don't recall seeing him much during the week, except at breakfast each morning before he left for the day. I am my daddy's little girl, girl and growing up, um, I did anything I could to spend time with him. When he would work on weekend projects around the house, I would help. So as a result, I learned how to install lighting and hang sheetrock and paint, among other things. Um, my dad also loved sports, and so I spent a lot of time with him at hockey games and basketball games and Golden Gloves boxing, so there's that. <laughs> uh, it seemed to me that uh, my brother would accompany my dad on these events, but he never wanted to do any of these things with him, so dad took me instead. Occasionally on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, my dad would say, let's go shopping. Um, we would dress up because he said, you get better service when you look your best, and then we'd go to the mall. He would introduce me to everyone as his baby, and he still does, by the way, um, and he made me feel very special. While growing up, I worked at the shop for my dad. Uh, when I was younger, I would clean or take inventory, put away supply orders. When he ran errands, I went with him. And as I got older, I worked there full-time during my summer break from school. Even before I had a driver's license, I would train his new employees and instruct them on where all of his suppliers or customers were located. And my dad taught me skills and work ethic that have benefited me my entire life. My mother stayed at home with me for the first few years, then went to work for my dad part-time when I started school. A few years later, she went back to school to get her degree and I became very self-sufficient at that time and took care of myself a lot. We were the first house on our block to get a microwave oven, and so I made my own dinner most of the time. <laughs> it felt like my mom studied all the time. I felt more neglected by her than I did my dad because she was at home, and I just wasn't allowed to speak to her unless she got up from her books. She became very unapproachable, and I grew fiercely independent. I lived in a great neighborhood with a lot of other children, and we were all basically good kids and grew up very close together. I remember leaving the house in the morning and riding my bicycle for miles all day, just making sure I was home when the street lights came on. Um, we lived on a dead-end street, and on the first day of summer break every year, all of us kids would join together to break out the street light on the corner. It, not only was it kind of the symbolic end to curfews, but it made hide-and-go-seek a whole lot more challenging. <laughs> My sister is eight years older than I am, and we have never been very close. Uh, she seemed to be jealous of me from my birth, and it, was, it has not improved much during our lives. The age difference is definitely an issue, since I was just a pain that she had to babysit for years. There have been a few seasons where we were closer than others, but they seldom lasted long. My brother and I, however, grew up very close. We had a lot more in common, as I was somewhat of a tomboy. When playing with the neighbor kids, I would always wanted to be involved in whatever it was my brother was doing. And that's where I first developed some of my codependency traits. As my brother entered his teen years, I started and, and he started to experiment with drugs and alcohol. I would wait up for him on Friday or Saturday nights and often help him get into the house without waking our parents. I also started to experiment a little, but I was five years younger than him. I believe I was 10 when I first tried marijuana. My home was divided when it came to religion. My mother took us to church every Sunday, but my father would never go. It was not a Christian church, and it also had no impact on our family the rest of the week. I would usually try to negotiate my way out of going by volunteering to help my dad with more projects. It seldom worked. As a teenager, I was insecure and had a poor self-image. I didn't have the musical talents of my brother. I didn't possess the physical abilities of an athlete. I didn't particular, particularly care for school. Um, I was a decent student, but not exceptional like my sister. I never seemed to really find my place, which led me to get involved with a group of friends that I should have avoided. 
One of them was my age, but most of them were older by a few years. One weekend, a few years, a few days, excuse me, after my 13th birthday, they invited me to a movie, and my parents allowed me to go. We got a ride to the theater from one of the other girl's mother, but we didn't make it to the movie. They had apparently made arrangements to hook up with some boys, and they picked us up from there. They had alcohol with them, and we drove to a secluded area behind the Capitol building. One of the boys took an interest in me and asked me to take a walk with him. We didn't get far before he was all over me, and I could not stop him. Later, the other girls said they could hear my cries for help, but they did nothing. Afterward, when they drove me home, they dropped me off around the corner from my house. As I walked up the driveway, I remember feeling relieved to be home. But as I entered, my parents were waiting for me, furious. During the night, they had been in contact with another of the girl's parents and discovered that we were not at the theater. They accused me of lying about what our plans were so that I could go out. This was the only time that I ever received the punishment of my father's belt. I said nothing to them of the night's events or anything for that matter. I just re remember feeling broken and betrayed. Betrayed by what felt like everyone in my life, I completely withdrew into myself. I immediately quit hanging out with that group of friends. I was withdrawn at home and spent most of my time alone in my room. I didn't feel like there was anyone I could talk to or trust. At school, the other students now perceived me as stuck up because I wasn't friends with anyone. When they would hurl their insults at me, I just held my head high and said thank you. Even though I pretended not to be affected, I stuffed each word inside, and they would repeat over and over again in my mind. I started building walls around myself that were thick and strong as I attempted to isolate myself from all the hurt. I took no interest in boys. I knew what they were about. The following summer, I had an opportunity to attend the best high school in the state. My parents took me to test with over 600 other students for a chance to be chosen for eight openings in the coming year. A few weeks later, I found out that I had been selected, but because of my insecurity and my low self-esteem, I refused to go and registered instead for the high school I was zoned for. On the first day, I, I attended my first three classes and ditched the rest. On the second day, I skipped the first three, but made it to the rest of them. For the rest of that year, I do not recall ever attending all of my classes on the same day. By spring, I was put on probation and ordered to report to juvenile court for truancy. And near the end of the school year, I ran away from home my first time. I was gone for four days. I ran away several more times and spent most of the summer on the street. When school started the next year, I was expelled the first day. Seems they'd had enough of me the previous year. I was kicked out of all three schools I attended that year, and despite obvious improvements and good grades. Being kicked out of school solidified my feelings of not being wanted, so again, I ran. Living on the street, I was subject, subjected to unspeakable horrors, including escaping from nearly being trafficked in Las Vegas. I didn't believe I was worth anything more than that. I was used goods, and I was getting what I deserved. Because I had violated my probation when I ran away, I was picked up and sent to juvenile detention for nearly a month. While there, they tested me with every intelligence or IQ test you could think of. And because of the results of my scores showed I was scoring at college levels, they determined it would be useless to try and send me back to high school. So at 16, I started cosmetology school. I felt like things were starting to go well for me. I loved school, and I made a few friends. After a year, I graduated and started working full-time in a salon. And about that time, I met someone and we started dating. After just a few months, I discovered I was pregnant. After I told him, he started avoiding me and taught taking my calls. Then I discovered that he was moving out of state to get away from the responsibility. Once again, I had to face my feelings of unworthiness and rejection. The decision on whether to keep my child was not an easy one, but I have never regretted keeping my son. My parents were a great support to me during that time. Living with my dad, I was able to stay at home with my son for nearly a year before getting a job. A few years later, I started a new job and met the man that would become my first husband. 
While I had been an occasional drinker, it was at this time I would start drinking and using drugs regularly, since he was an, a habitual user. When he changed jobs, he met and we became friends with another couple. We spent most weekends together playing cards and drinking. When they had an opportunity to move to Las Vegas for a career, we followed them about a month later. Career-wise, the move was the best thing we all could have done. Relationship-wise, it was a disaster. I soon discovered that my husband was not only an alcoholic addict, but he was also addicted to pornography. He would frequently choose pornography over me and tell me that it was because I wasn't enough. He was also verbally and emotionally abusive to me and my son. And when the abuse became physical, I filed for a restraining order and a divorce. The friends that we had moved, moved with there um, were supportive of me as I went through my divorce, and we became even closer. I was about a, it was about a year later that I was able to support him as he also went through a divorce. And it didn't take long for Lane and I to move from friendship to dating. We partied and went to the bar nearly every night. During this time, my alcohol addiction really accelerated, and at the end of a crazy, drunken evening, I was arrested on a domestic charge. In an attempt to salvage the relationship, Lane and I agreed that we would quit drinking. So I quit. He did not. He would lie and sneak around in order to drink, and I felt like he was cheating on me, but I knew her name, and it was alcohol. I had remained sober for just over two years when we got married. I'm not sure why he asked or why I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> a few months later, we went on our honeymoon, which was a nightmare. Lane was sneaking around the resort for a couple of days when I finally told him to bring me whatever it was that he was drinking. So we drank for the next three days of the trip. That was not the right decision. I wanted nothing more than to get an early flight home and leave him behind with no money or passport. <laughs> I did recognize once again that alcohol was not for me, so I have not drank since the day we came home, October 11th, 2001. <laughs> the next year was status quo. Me sober but feeling trapped as Lane's addiction progressed as Christmas approached, everything got worse. It seemed to happen every year. But then the phone call came. A week before Christmas, my uncle ended his life after getting his third DUI. It was a whirlwind of emotions. Apparently it still is. As it seemed the rest of the world was joyously awaiting Christmas, I was mourning the loss of a beloved family member. After the funeral on the flight home, I was completely exhausted and emotionally drained. My emotional state did not improve, improve as I was greeted by my husband, who after being unsupervised for four days, was completely out of control in his addiction. Three days later, the day after Christmas, he assaulted me and fled as I called the police. I hit my knees and sobbing, I cried out to God. I didn't even know if I believed there was a God, but I asked him if he, if he was there and saw me. I needed his help. Lane came home after I had gone to sleep. A week later, he repeated the offense. This time, he was apprehended in the parking lot, and I was able to get an immediate restraining order. Again, I cried out to God, but this time I said, if you are there, I obviously don't matter to you. I asked for help, and this is what I get for it. I'm not sure if someone knows when they're about to have a nervous breakdown, but if they do, I felt like that. This was my bottom, and I have never felt worse. I couldn't think, and I didn't know what to do. When Lane's sister called and convinced me to stay in the apartment, even if temporarily. After a few weeks, I allowed Lane to come back into the apartment because I felt I owed it to her. I didn't trust him or even like him, and I was just biding my time until I could move on. Lane was going to AA meetings regularly, and at the prompting of his sponsor, my friend, I started to go with him occasionally. 
I didn't know why he wanted me to go. I didn't need these meetings. I had already quit drinking on my own. <laughs> my favorite meeting was a speaker meeting we attended at a big church. And when Easter came, we decided to attend service there. I didn't know what I was expecting, but I know I hadn't expected to meet Jesus. We started attending services regularly and even went to a Sunday school class where I learned what would become my life verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. After a few months, they announced they were starting a Christ-centered recovery group, and that was my introduction to Celebrate Recovery. They didn't follow the curriculum for long, however, and in a series of events that led to some pretty deep church hurts, we left to find another church and CR. Lane immediately got involved. I was less enthusiastic. Not only was I not committed to the church or to CR, I was not all that committed to my marriage. About two years into recovery, I was still unhappy and still wanted a divorce. I went to a CR leadership Christmas party with Lane, and I was incredibly self-conscious and uncomfortable since I didn't really know anyone. But of course, they all knew who I was and kept talking to me about how much they liked Lane. <laughs> the one that won me over, however, was the ministry leader, Merlin. She handed me a small gift she had purchased just for me, leaned in close and whispered to me, thank you for allowing us to get to know your husband. I, can re I cannot remember what the gift was. The significance was that she saw me, and even though she didn't know me, she demonstrated that I had value. After that, I started attending CR, and I joined a step study. It was definitely the most powerful growth journey I had ever been on. In step study, everybody kept talking about the dreaded fourth step. I thought, what's so bad about this, listing all this junk on a piece of paper? It replays over in my mind daily anyway. But when I saw the fifth step, I thought, no way. <laughs> I am not telling anyone that stuff. <laughs> James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. If I confess to God, I'm forgiven. But if I confess to someone else, I'm healed. And that's what I needed more than anything. And I started to heal from the wreckage of my past, both what it was done to me and what I had done to others. My marriage improved. Most importantly, my relationship with Jesus flourished. My dad had taught me to be independent, to rely only on myself, but my father taught me to be dependent on him, and that felt better than I ever could have expected. My favorite step is step, step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. When I pray, I draw closer to God and him to me. And in that place, I know I'm in his will. So in 2007, God moved us from Las Vegas to Little Rock. <laughs> the complete restoration on my marriage allowed me to follow the call that God had on Lane's life, and I had never even visited here before. At that time, we thought God had moved us because of Lane's career, but he had so much more planned for us. There is no doubt that he directed us here for this church. When we first arrived, first NLR didn't have a CR, so we attended one across town. It was always our prayer that we could have one here, and nine years ago, we invited some of the pastoral staff to a one day that was hosted by the CR that we attended and told them we wanted to start Celebrate Recovery at this church. At the time, I really had no idea how bold a request that was. They attended the seminar but declined to start CR and offered us a connection class instead. Although disappointed at the time, we agreed and Life Recovery Central was started. That is still going strong and we've also added Saturdays too. If you haven't attended yet, that yet, you should. It is quite special. So tonight marks five years since God answered our prayers and we were able to start CR here. Some of you may have noticed a shift in my story as I went from I to we. 
Because of God's grace, our marriage that was dead has been made alive. We are united in God's call on our lives. And through this ministry, God has continued to mold and shape me into who I was originally created to be. It has been amazing to see all that he has done, not just in my life or in Lane's life, but in your life. God is doing miracles in this place. Look around you. You have a front row seat. What Jesus has taught me through CR more than anything else is forgiveness. I have been able to forgive my abusers, my abandoners, my husband, and myself. I am able to forgive quickly and completely. And many times someone will apologize or make amends to me for something that I cannot even recall the offense because God has completely removed it. Resentment is like wearing a chain that keeps me bound to the pain. Forgiveness is the key that will release me. I don't forgive because they deserve it. I forgive because I do. So if you are new here tonight, I want you to know that you're welcome, and I'm glad you're here. There is a significant difference in sobriety and recovery. We can be sober and still be stuck in a sea of bitterness and pain, and recovery is the process that God uses to rid us of pain. Recovery cannot happen alone. It happens in community, this community. So if your marriage or relationships are dead, there is life here. God restores. If you don't want to be here, I understand. I've been there too. God will come to you. If you are a runner like I was, you can stop. You can rest. This place has what you're running to. Hope. Love. Acceptance. Even if you do not believe in him, Jesus believes in you. Surrender, his pursuit is relentless. God says in Isaiah 43, 19, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you.